to the 40 or so Letter Sounds in English Part 2. Um, so before we looked at the um, sounds that all the letters in the alphabet make, as well as a couple consonants that we represent with two letters, which was ch, sh, and mm. So as I mentioned in the last video, when we have one sound that we're representing with two letters, we call that two-letter pattern a digraph. So TH is a digraph that stands for the sound or mm. an easier example, SH is a digraph that sounds, stands for the sound SH. So a digraph is different than a consonant blend because in a digraph you're only representing one sound with your two letters. In a consonant blend um, you can have several letters that are standing for their own sound. So like CL as a consonant blend would be K, O, K, O. Um, or BR as a consonant blend would be B, R, R, R. So you can see if there's two letters, but they have their own sound. There's two sounds there. Whereas with a digraph, you have one sound that you have to represent with two letters because there's no letter in English to represent that sound. So we have a bunch of sounds in English that we usually represent with digraphs. So these kind of sneaky sounds fly under the radar and often kids don't get taught how to represent these sounds with letters. So that leaves them um, with some serious problems when they're trying to spell or um, when they're reading and they don't recognize those letter patterns. And I find it most efficient to teach digraphs as one cohesive letter pattern. When we get into the vowel digraphs, um, sometimes people try to apply rule to digraphs, like um, two vowels go walking and the first one does the talking. But this rule, first of all, is not accurate a lot of the times when two vowels go walking, the first one doesn't do the talking. And also, um, it doesn't allow students to be automatic in, in recognizing letters and decoding them. So if I have to sit down and look at AI and go, oh, okay, okay, there's two vowels, oh, there's an A, there's an I, that's two vowels, okay, what's the rule? Two vowels go walking, the first one does the talking. Okay, what's the first one? Uh, okay, it's the A. What does the A say? Oh, I think it's A. Okay, so that says A. That's extremely effortful, and it's not going to help the student read the word pain very quickly. Whereas if you teach A is represented by AI, they can sound it out. A, N, pain. Much easier. So we're going to talk about those sounds. So the first set of sounds we're going to talk about are the long vowel sounds. Um, and these are easy because the letter names are the long vowel sounds. So we have the sound A, A, and our digraph that we're going to represent A with is AI. As you're quickly going to realize, with a lot of these um, vowel sounds, um, it's, it's not so precise, the um, letters that you're going to use to represent them. So you're thinking to yourself, okay, A says, AI says A, but sure, AY says A, like at the end of day, or like in the word mate, we have A and then a T and then an E, and that says A. Um, oh, wait a minute, what about slay? That's A, but it's E-I-G-H. And you're totally right. There are sometimes multiple um, digraphs or letter patterns that represent these sounds, but we're just going to teach students the sound and then one letter pattern to represent them at first. So the sound A, we're going to represent with AI, A. E, E, that was nice and easy. I, going to represent that with IE. I being represented by IE is sort of okay at the beginning of stages because short words like pie and tie have the I at the end and it works, but um, you're going to need to teach them other ways to write the I sounds of time. O, O, here's our digraph for O, which you could see in boat, grown, um, road, lots of examples. O, U, U, U. I find this one one of the least useful letter patterns. Uh, it's tricky because um, we often interchange U and U, the spelling. So double O says U, but sometimes it says U in certain words. U-E says U, but it often says U. So in blue, U-E says U. In Q, it says 
you. So this one's a little less um, useful, but you're still just giving students a way to represent the sound ooh when they hear it to try to write it or to recognize it. Okay, so those are our long vowel sounds. Sometimes also included in that list is ooh. And um, I'm representing ooh with the double O and then the line over the top. That sometimes means a long sound. So different people represent it differently, but that's ooh, ooh, like in moon. Okay, now we get into the really tricky stuff. There's three vowel sounds called R controlled vowel sounds. They're called R controlled because when we write them, we write them with an R after a vowel letter. So these sounds are R, which we represent with A R. So this is like car, far, start, farm, um, Mars. And that one is a pretty good start with R controlled vowels because R, you almost always just represent it with the A and the R, so that's pretty consistent. Okay, our next one is or. Or. Like for, corn, um, born, port, or. And the last one is er, and this is the vowel sound er, as opposed to the consonant er, er. So er is often represented by er. Um, you may also want to teach students that it's represented by ir and ur. So it's represented by er, like in the word her. It's represented by ir, like in the word bird. And it's represented by ur, like in the word turn. So um, this is one of those ones where you have one sound and there's a few different patterns that represent it depending on what word. Okay, um, our last few, we have the short uh sound. Um, and I've, the letter pattern I've chosen to represent uh is two o's with these little short, kind of look like eye, upside down eyebrows on top. Um, uh, so this would be like in the word book or look, uh. Okay, two more, we have oi, oi, there's oi, and so when you're um, writing oi in the middle of a word, you're going to write oi, like coin, or, I'll have to give another example, coin, foit, <laughs> um, but if you hear oi at the end of a word, you write oi. This is very much similar to A, which in the middle of a word can be represented AI, but if you hear the A at the end of the word, it's going to be AY. So that one is a rule about why we're using certain digraphs um, to represent the sound at one point and not another. So, OI. OI. And last but not least, OW. OW. And here is our letter pattern to represent OW. Um, I chose this one for last because I think it's a nice, clear illustration about um, a concept some people call code overlap, which means that um, the digraph ow in English can represent the sound ow, or the ow can also represent the sound often o, like in glow, snow, um, I'm trying to think, tow, like I towed the car. So some people despair and think, this is horrible, English is so unpredictable, how am I supposed to teach this? OW can say oh, it can say ow, who knows what else it could say. And I hear what you're saying, English is very much more complex because of our lack of one-to-one -one correspondence, because of code overlap, because of redundant letters like C and Q and X, but there's a lot of patterns that are very useful and very consistent, and when you teach them to students, um, as long as you also teach them to be flexible, and as long as you yourself are considering what words you're trying to get them to sound out, um, can often be uh, really, really, really helpful. And they are absolutely essential for your struggling readers. So I hope that this has helped you see the 40 or so sounds in English and how to represent them with letters. And if you have any questions or comments, I will be happy to respond to you. Thanks.